Hi everybody, this is Brian James from Rhino3D.com and in this Rhino video tutorial I want to show you how I would go about modeling a lamp or a lighting fixture and rendering that design in Rhino. I'm going to start by drawing a curve and this will represent half of the base of a lamp design. I'm working in the template of small objects inches but you could work in any unit of measurement you like. I'll then take the control points for this half of the lamp base and adjust them. I'll draw another curve representing the shade profile. I'll use an O-snap and smart track so that I come out straight to the side in line with the top of the base. I'll adjust the control points a little bit before creating two revolve surfaces. I'll select both and use the revolve command. I'll need to select a revolve axis and I'll use an O snap and then the full circle option which is the letter F in the command. Then ZEA to zoom extents all viewports and go into shaded mode. I want to next model the structure where the shade will join to the lamp base. I'll start by drawing two lines from end snaps to center snaps. The centers are the two circles at the top and bottom of the shade. I'll move back those endpoints a little bit. I'll need another structure in the middle, but these two lines will represent a pipe coming off of the edge of the lampshade. I'll want more than one on the top and bottom, so I'll use the command array polar to pattern three around that center. Next, I want a pipe on the top and bottom of the shade as well, so I'll use the dupe edge command to create curves at both of those locations. I'll select all the curves with cell CRV and then deselect my initial profiles before grouping all the curves together that I want to be pipes. Then I'll go into the properties panel and use the curve piping modifier. This will make those curves look like they're pipes even though they're not. I'll use a tube to create the structure between the pipes and I'll extrude it to both sides with the option in the command line. I'll want this tube to have a softened edge so it reflects better when it has a metallic material, so I'll use another custom render mesh modifier called Edge Softening. This too is in the Properties panel, and you just adjust the softening radius for the size object. Next I'll use the copy command and copy from the top center snap of the shade to the bottom center snap of the shade. And now I have a rudimentary structure for the lampshade itself, consisting of these pipes and those two tubes. I'll use the add to group command to add those tubes to my pipe group. This will make assigning a material easier later. I'll make one additional line and this will be the rod that will hold the light bulb up. I'll scale it and just move it down a bit and I've gone into ghosted mode here so I can see the line through the shade. I'll enable curve piping for this rod as well and reduce the thickness. I'll take that post and adjust the end cap option for the curve piping modifier so it's flat on the top. And then I'll make a sphere. This sphere will represent the light bulb for the lamp. The rod can be edited, and remember it's still just a curve, so if we take the top control point, we can drag that down and the pipe volume that we see will also shrink as we move that down. Mm -hmm. 
Next, we need to add a point light. You can use the light fly out there under the spotlight icon or the render tools toolbar group and add a point light. I used an end snap at the top of the sphere and then I'll drag it down into the sphere. The point light will have its own properties in the property panel. Now this point light can't shine any light while it's inside the sphere. So I'll need to select the sphere and within the properties panel disable its ability to cast shadows. We're about to add materials, but the shade itself will need a physical thickness. So I'm going to use yet another render mesh modifier called thickness. In the properties panel, you can turn that on and set the distance. I'll use 500. Now we're ready to start assigning some materials and we can go into the materials panel and create those materials. I'll click the plus and first create an emission material. You can think of this as the material for the light bulb and I'll name it bulb. Then I'll create a physically based material, name this one shade, create another PBR or physically based material and name that one base. And I'll make a metal material that I'll name accents. And this will represent uh, any metallic details on the top and bottom of the shade, as well as those pipes we made. I'll assign the materials we've created by right-clicking over each material swatch and choosing Assign to Object. So the bulb material gets the bulb, the base gets the base material, and so on. I'll then go into Rendered Mode and rendered mode is going to give me a preview of what the lighting and materials and textures will look when we actually create a render. If we turn off curves in rendered mode, the pipes that we've created with the curve piping object property, they will disappear. So you have to have curves on in the rendered mode in order to see the curve piping. Next, I'm going to draw a wall shape, and this is because I want to see the pattern of any shadow cast from my lampshade. So I make just a little L shape and then use the gumball to extrude it up and down. And I'll need a small table for my lamp to be on as well. So in the top view, I'll use the box command and make a box at center. I'll use zero as the location and hold down shift to keep it square. And then I'll set the width numerically and I'll just type 0.5 so it's half an inch thick. Next, I'll create a material for this tabletop. I'll go back into the materials panel and click the plus symbol. I'll choose import from material library and in the wood section, I'll pick a wood material and click open. This wood texture is assigned to the tabletop and then I'll change it in the type dropdown to a physically based material. This will give me more options. The texture within the material comes over and I can adjust the size of it in its size fields. Now it's using world coordinate system box style so it's projecting from six sides of a box inward on the scene. And that size is what the real world size is of that thumbnail swatch you see in the bitmap texture. I'll rotate it finally 90 degrees here. I think I like the grain that direction and I'll make that swatch 10 inches by 10 inches. I'll then add a clear coat which is the advantage of changing to a physically based material. You have many more detailed settings you can use. For the base for the lamp, it looks like my lampshade is in the table a bit, so let's adjust that. 
drag down that tabletop. For the structure that holds the lampshade to the base, those pipes and tubes we made, I'll go into the Properties panel and I'll disable their ability to cast shadows, just as we did for the sphere which represents the light bulb. I'll then change the display mode to Ray Traced, and this will allow light to bounce around in the scene. Ray Traced is controlled by the settings in the Rendering panel. There's also a sample count in the lower right corner of the viewport, and I'll drop that down from the default of 1000 to 50. This will keep the Ray Traced mode from working too hard. I'll drop the intensity of the skylight to 0.2 so that we see more of the point light power than we do the skylight, which is an overall lighting around the scene. The point light itself has properties in the properties panel, and I'll change the fall off type to linear. I find this is more realistic. You can drop the shadow intensity as well, and this will blur the edge of the shadow. You don't want to do this too much, so probably somewhere around 80 or 90 is going to be fine. If you drop it too much, you won't see the shadow created from any detail in the shade. I'll change the color as well so that it has more of an incandescent yellowish color and drop the intensity down. I find the intensity needs to be dropped when using linear especially but it's a matter of taste and a matter of the type of lighting design that you're working on. Back in the materials, let's look at the shade material. I'll click Detailed Settings and add a base color channel. I'll click to assign a texture for the base color, and I'll choose from more texture types. I'll then pick a gradient texture from the procedural menu that pops up. And this black to white texture is tiled one by one. In the mapping section, I'll change the repeat value in the V direction to two. Ray traced mode doesn't always catch up when you make a change. You can see if I go to rendered mode, you can see the gradient texture is twice. So I'll toggle out of ray traced and then back into it to show the repeat. Now I don't want it going black to white then to black. So I can use this flip alternate gradients option, and now it goes from white to black, then to black again, then to white. You can also swap colors if you wanted to. Now the purpose of this is that I want the shade to actually have a lighter color in the very center of it. So I'll use a light yellow color for the center, and then on the outer edges, the top and bottom of the shade, a slightly darker version of that same color. Now I'm doing all this in the color channel of the material because it's easier to see it here, but ultimately this gradient texture is bound for a subsurface channel. So I'll click Detailed Settings and add a subsurface channel to this material, and I'll click and drag the gradient texture down to Scattering Color. Now subsurface scattering is letting light scatter through the material, so it has this scattering color texture channel that we can use. And I'll toggle out of Ray Traced and back into it just to make sure that the changes that I made get updated. And I'll change that subsurface amount to 0.4 from 0.2. And this will cause more light to scatter or the amount of the effect will be increased. If we turn off the thickness modifier for the shade, the subsurfacing channel in the physically based material won't work the same anymore. So you need to have a thickness to the object for subsurface to make a difference. Let's change the color for that accent material now. If we go into that metal material, we can click the color field, and if you use the custom color list, you can see these preset colors for metal types, and I'll choose one of the golds there. And I'll go back to rendered 
and then back to ray traced. So toggling in and out of ray traced, it didn't update the curve piping material with ray traced running. In the base material, I'll add a base color channel and we can do something fun here. I'll choose from more texture types and I'll start with a marble texture. And the marble texture is using black and white to create this marble. And that marble texture, you can adjust the vein width as well as the size of the vein pattern. And I really just want one stripe here. So I'm making a size of four for the marble and then the vein width I'm dropping down until I like the thinness of the line. And you can blur the transition between those two colors. Now the black color in the marble texture, we can throw another procedural in. So I go back to the procedural list and this time I'll use a fractal based texture, an FBM texture. And you can choose two colors here. I'll choose two blue values. And this is like a noise texture. So this will take place just in the black area or what was the black area of the marble texture. So I'm layering two different procedural textures here for the base of the lamp. And the texture mapping is by surface right now, but I'm going to enable cylindrical mapping and I won't use a capped cylinder. And this is going to allow me a little bit more control. I'll show the mapping widget and you can scale and rotate this mapping widget, move it around. And when I'm done with the adjustment, I'll rotate the seam out of the way, I think. And when I'm done, I'll turn off the mapping widget in the texture mapping properties for the object. Back in the material, you can also change that repeat of the FBM texture so I don't have quite as much detail happening. And then I'll go back into ray traced. Now, ray trace mode will flicker for a moment as textures bake, especially when you're using custom mapping like this and have procedurals. So you'll see it flicker and then once it starts calculating again, that is the baked texture. I'll add another layer to this material for the base. I'll add another subsurface channel and I'll just change it to a solid color here. Like an aquamarine teal type color and I'll increase the amount of the subsurface effect. So this is going to be on top of the color texture that we added. And I'll add a little bit more depth to that material. And we can add a clear coat as well. I, I like the clear coat addition to physically based materials. It adds just a little bit more shine and realism to the surface. And it has its own roughness value, which I'll put at 0.5 for the base. I'll go back into the shade material and add an opacity channel to this physically based material. I'll click to assign a texture in the amount channel, choose from more texture types, import from material library, go into the textures folder of the material library, and pick one of these black and white textures. I'll pick fibers five. And now this is controlling the shadow or what is opaque and what is not in the shade. You can adjust the percentage that texture will influence the opacity in the percentage field to the right of that texture slot. The remaining percentage will go to that numeric field for the amount, so I'll set that to 1. 
Within the texture, you can change the repeat value. Now currently it's using surface mapping, which is mapping channel one. So it's using the U and V directions of the surface. I'll increase the number of repeats for the texture until I like the way it looks. And then I'll go into ray traced mode and see the effect. It'll take a few samples before you can see the definition of the shadow now on the wall behind the lampshade. I'll add another channel, I'll add bump, and I'll take that fibers texture and while holding down the Alt key, I'll drag it into the bump channel. Holding down Alt, or if you're on Mac, the Option key will create an instance of the texture. Now when we change the repeat values, it'll change it for any other instance of it. I'll do the same thing for the color channel, and I'll change the amount that texture in the color channel is used to 50%. It'll take about 10 samples before the subsurfacing kicks in. So after the textures bake in the ray trace display mode and we get to 10 or more samples, then we're gonna to start to get a good indication of what the material is gonna look like. I'll select that point light and change the intensity. I want the shade to be a little bit brighter. And that's going to be controlled by not only the intensity of the point light, but also the values for the subsurface channel in the material for the shade. So if we go back to the bulb, we could change the color of that. The main purpose of the emission material in the bulb is in case you see the bulb through the shade. Or if you had something like neon lighting, the emission material would be crucial there to create the effect. In the rendering panel, I'm going to change the environment used for reflection. And this is going to be significant for those highlights on the metal elements. I'll also change the environment for the skylight. And I'm picking environments from the environment library. I'll have to drop the intensity down of that new environment down to 0.2. We want a little bit of light coming from around the scene, but not so much that it isn't apparent that the light itself is casting light. In the rendering panel, I'll adjust the resolution and quality. The dimension drop down, I'll change it to custom and then enter the size for width and height of the final image. I'll also change the quality drop down there to good quality, which will equal 500 samples in the final render. I want to make a few more adjustments before doing the final render. And one of the things I know I'm going to want to adjust here for a brighter result through the shade is that point light. But there's several factors. The subsurface amount is also a factor in how bright that shade looks. So I'll increase the amount there in the subsurface channel of that shade material. And I'll also adjust that scattering radius. So if we make that a higher value, you'll see after a few samples in the ray traced mode, the shade's going to be a lot brighter. And I have the point light selected so I'll go into the Properties panel and just adjust the intensity of the point light a little bit more. And ray trace mode is really useful for figuring out how the light's going to look. And this is why I initially had the sample count so low in the heads-up display, that lower right corner of the ray traced mode. 
There's no need to have it try and get to a thousand samples for this. I just need it to get above 20 samples and I can judge a, a lighting change. But this is a balancing act of many variables here and the shade material has that gradient texture in it as well if you recall from the beginning of the setup. So after I change my subsurface scattering radius or the intensity of the point light, I may need to come back into this gradient texture and adjust the values of those colors because those are the top and bottom colors in the shade. And then I'll click the render icon or run the render command and this will produce an image identical to the ray traced display mode but at the image width and height that I set in the rendering panel and targeting the sample count or the quality setting rather that was set in the rendering panel. So you can see in the lower left corner of the render window that it is trying to get to 500 samples. Now I'm not going to wait for it to get above a couple hundred samples here. I'll stop the recording of the video and I'll come back to show you how I'll finish this off with some post effects. Here's our result after 10 minutes. I'll click the plus symbol in the post effects section and add a bloom post effect. I'll decrease the brightness threshold, increase the radius, and reduce the intensity. You can do all three of these sliders to whatever setting makes sense for your image, but if you toggle it on and off you can see the effect. In the final pass section, I'll add hue, saturation, and luminance, and up the luminance a little bit. This will make it pop a bit more. There's also brightness and contrast, which you can play with, either decreasing or increasing that brightness. It'll be an overall brightness to the image. In the center section, you have tone mapping, and filmic medium contrast is the one I go to the most, but there are other options here that you can play with. It'll balance the lights and darks within the image. If you did something like filmic high contrast, it can make for a very stylized, contrasty image. If I do use high contrast, I'll adjust brightness and contrast and luminance in addition to that to dial it in. In this case, I think medium contrast filmic is best with just a little bit of luminance adjustment. And finally, in the post effects section, I'll turn on the Intel denoiser to wash out any grain left in the image after the 10 minutes. The denoiser plugins are available through the package manager command if you do not have them in your post effects section. You'll have to restart Rhino, but then you can use them to remove grain in any image you make with the render command. I'll zoom out one to one so you can see all the detail here. And that's an example of modeling and rendering a design for a lamp using Rhino 7. Thanks for watching.